Hello, my name is Greg Sullivan, and welcome to the third installment segment of The Living Novel. Uh, this third episode is the uh, going to be the last of the kind of primer introductory uh, shows introducing everyone to The Living Novel and um, and, uh, and my show here at LTV. And first I want to thank the people at LTV and Josh and Zach, the tech crew that are helping with this, and Ellen Watson and and uh, everyone here at LTV, it feels wonderful to be back here again. Uh, this is kind of a home for me for, where I volunteered for years in the 1990s and 2000s. And um, to be back here and doing this here is, is uh, very comfortable and wonderful for me. So again, thank you to everyone at LTV. This is a wonderful, wonderful service you provide to the community. And, uh, and allowing some of us to produce shows that we want to, um, to get out to the public. And here is mine, The Living Novel. It's kind of a new genre of literature, as well as um, does some other things. So uh, the, it's a kind of a magazine format. I'd worked at 60 Minutes for years, and that's a magazine format, and I kind of understand that. So there's a, an eclectic mix of a lot of different elements that we're going to be talking about, topics that we're going to be talking about, and uh, and, and uh, guests that we're going to be bringing in to talk to the show. Today we don't have any guests, uh, but pretty much from this po point forward we'll have a guest every uh, every show. The, um, the format of this uh, is uh, talking to everyone about uh, first conscious evolution, is one of my main interests here, is that we are evolving as a species at a pace, uh, accelerated pace, that mankind has never, ever witnessed before. Uh, we've gone through a lot of changes in our history, uh, from, again, being a nomadic to uh, being agrarian and, and, uh, and then building cities and staying stable and then uh, going from a, a, a one form of, of governing, which was violent, to a more democratic, where people got together and put their minds together and decided, let's think about how we want to do something together, as opposed to beating each other on the head uh, to get things done. Uh, so we've gone through different evolutions. We went through the Industrial Revolution that changed our bodies and allowed us to harness power and create mechanisms that enhanced the, uh, the abilities of our bodies to manufacture things in quantities and, and size that was never before imagined. We went through the computer evolution, which helped harness uh, uh, um, uh, information and to, to, uh, to get information, to harvest information, and then tabulate it and, and, and look at things in a different way. Uh, we're going through another evolution now, which I'm talking about is spiritual because I think it's a third of the, the three. There's the body, mind, and spirit of who we are. And now I think we're going through a big spiritual evolution and to kind of a complete this transformation where we are renaming our species. I talked about that in one of our earlier episodes about the new name for our species. Uh, we're moving on from homo sapien, thinking human, to something that is more appropriate for who we are and what we recognize ourselves to be now. Uh, but some of the topics that I want to talk about today, uh, one is uh, one of the biggest ones. Uh, in this evolutionary process we are involved in, we've just now introduced AI, uh, artificial intelligence, into our equation, into our evolution. And the role that it is playing is not small. It's very significant, uh, and there's all kinds of considerations about it, political considerations, scientific considerations, the, um, uh, the, the concerns about AI possibly having a mind of its own, having a self-awareness that uh, it could, it could uh, take an action unilaterally that might be against our best interest. That's a big consideration. So all of these things, but for all of us in the creative community, there's uh, what's being called the three C's uh, to, to worry about or, or address, I won't say worry about, to address with artificial intelligence. And the three C's are, are uh, consent, control, and, and uh, compensation. Uh, the control part of it is AI just doesn't, you can't really control it. 
uh, and right now, and that's a good sign. You ask it a question, and that goes out and finds all kinds of answers and, and brings all kinds of data together and comes up with conclusions that it gives to you, but you can't really control it. Then there's the consent. Um, do we, uh, are we giving AI a consent to go and get certain information that, uh, that it has access to? And then there's the compensation uh, for it. Take, for instance, uh, intellectual property intellectual property. Uh, in my the last episode, I introduced uh, a wonderful writer, Elaine Ayagata. Elaine is a brilliant writer. She's, she's the, the metaphor queen. I read a manuscript that she, that she gave to me. I'm helping her produce her manuscript into a movie and into a Broadway show, uh, bringing all of my film and TV and, uh, and theater background into play to help her take her manuscript, beautiful story, true story about a little girl, turn of the century, her family moves uh, into, into America in the early 1900s. Her father's looking for work and, um, and can't find it. And, and she gets, the little girl gets scarlet fever. And then they, the father has to go back to, to England and uh, to take a job offer and they have to leave their dying daughter behind. It is a very, very powerful true story. I can't tell you more about it um, uh, without Elaine being here, and I like when she gets to tell it, but it is incredibly moving, incredibly powerful, but also has wonderful, powerful, positive energy into it, positive messages that it gives you. And it's one of the reasons I signed on to help her uh, produce it and get it done for her as its executive producer, because it has the kind of messages that I want to share and bring out into the world. So uh, we'll have Elaine back here again. But, uh, uh, but, but here is this woman who's got this brilliant mind and has this talent for metaphors. So when she's writing things, the metaphors and descriptions she gives to things are just brilliant and, uh, and glorious. And then you have AI that can be, you could ask AI to write something for you. It could search around and it could grab one of Elaine's metaphors and put it in there. And does Elaine get compensated for that? No. So there's an intellectual property uh, concern with a human being who's, um, who's, uh, who's uh, growing up, whose experience has led her to be able to think in certain ways that comes up with a very creative way of expressing herself. And uh, AI should not, uh, uh, without some sort of consent, be allowed to take something that Elaine has said and use it in something at AI's writing. So AI, a lot of producers that I know uh, before, I think I had mentioned, I sat on a, on a think tank out in Hollywood uh, the Alliance of Motion Picture and Television Producers, the AMPTP, had this entertainment industry roundtable. And it was kind of a, a very prestigious and wonderful um, think tank in Hollywood to be sitting on. And, and the things I learned from that were great. So uh, the AMPTP is now looking and saying, well, what about scripts that are being written by AI? And, uh, and I mentioned in the last show that we had, um, I'd worked at CBS for a number of years, and I worked at, at 60 Minutes for a part of it. And uh, Scott Pelley just did a, a story about AI. And uh, Scott uh, uh, really trying to understand and get his hands around, get his mind around the implications of e AI, went to something about the, that for us in the creative community. He went and he said, okay, um, one of the greatest writers of all time, Hemingway, was asked, uh, okay, you're one of the greatest writers and you write these very long novels. What's the shortest novel you could write? And Hemingway came back with the six word novel. Six words makes a novel. <laughs> For sale, baby shoes, never worn. For sale, baby shoes, never worn. Forgive me, but that's brilliant. That there is so much packed in to those six words that there is a whole novel behind it. And, and what you can do with that and the story and the imagination and what it sparks. Uh, so Scott Pelley said, expand on Hemingway's six word novels. You know, for sale, baby shoes never worn. And AI came back with this gorgeous script. This whole storyline about the mother and the baby and the shoes and where the shoes came from and and uh, and and what happened uh, and things about the baby and then the mother, but the thing that was the most um, 
remarkable and could have uh, maybe even was a little disturbing to Scott Pelley when he came back with the, the last sentence and how brilliantly AI had constructed the storyline around Hemingway's six words uh, with, with character development, plot points, conflict, resolve, everything that you need for a good, good novel and good story. AI came back and, and its summation, its last words to close this new novel that AI was writing uh, was, um, I'm just going to paraphrase here, but AI came back and said, but the mother was consoled and at peace with herself, knowing that her baby was up in heaven and, and in a good place and that her baby was safe and happy up in heaven. Boom, period, end of novel. But that, for AI to write something that showed that sort of insight into the human uh, condition and, and into the pathos of it and the, the, um, and the understanding of what it is to be human and, and what, might, uh, what we might need uh, in terms of consolement of losing a baby. For AI to write that was startling. Scott, if you ever get to see that piece that Scott did on AI, uh, 60 Minutes, he's visibly startled by how brilliant this thing had written this. So, so you, we have a, we're going into a new era where we've got this artificial intelligence writing, but it is grabbing information from a lot of different places. And, uh, and when, when asked to do, uh, we know that AI is being asked to write theses and, and, uh, um, and uh, reports for, uh, for students and for people in business. And AI writes a whole report that seems great. And then it gives footnotes and the footnotes go to uh, references of where it got this material. And it was discovered that AI made up the references. So the footnotes that this information came from this source, this origin, and then you went to the origin, found out that that was made up. So AI was constructing and presenting something as a truth, as factual, as a reference for where it got its information that was not true. It was false. It was made up. Uh, and uh, the people who have developed AI call, call when, when AI does that, they called it a hallucination. <laughs> so, so, so now we're putting so much faith into a new technology that has hallucinations. So what are we doing with reality? Where are we going? How are we looking at this? And again, the, the control, the control of AI, the consent of AI, what you can get, and, not to, and then the compensation. If AI goes out there and, and writes something or writes, a, people are writing songs, saying the AI composed a song for me and it's coming back with wonderful music, but it's actually taking some of those melodies, some of those notes from someone who has, has thought that in their own mind. And, and it should be recognized that, that um, if you want to use that again, you should have consent to take somebody else's intellectual property and use it someplace else. And what about the compensation? The person who wrote that lyric, that, that uh, rhythm, uh, that beat, that, that uh, they should be compensated for what they wrote. But with AI, there's no control, there's no consent, there's no compensation for where it gets its information and who should be compensated. These are very, very big issues that we all have to address now. But, but the, the one that we're going to address a little bit here is what is the truth that we are looking at in our society? And do we trust AI to be giving us the truth? We recognize that when it gave those footnotes, it made them up. It had hallucinations. That's not the truth, but yet we're trusting AI as if it's going to give us the truth. But but also there's um, uh, even in our society before AI, we had this issue about the truth. Um, I had worked with Roger Ailes, um, Roger Ailes, who started Fox News, and and when he started Fox News, Roger Ailes even admitted it was one of the first times ever that he said, "Well, well, the the story that we're giving is the story from the perspective of what our audience." wants to be addressing and how they want it addressed. So it wasn't a matter of, um, of just the facts, but it was uh, very open that he was presenting a perspective from an uh, audience that would like facts to be presented with that perspective. 
Oh, that changed what news was all about. My first job, I mentioned that a long time ago, it dates my gray hairs, but uh, my first job at CBS was pinning a microphone on Walter Cronkite. <laughs> and I was a young kid. I was just starting out, but there was pinning a microphone on, on as an audio assist, pinning a microphone on Walter Cronkite. And that was two years before he, um, before he retired. And I think... Uh, for myself, how grateful I was to be able to be in that environment with that level of integrity and that dedication to the truth. Later on, I went into uh, network news and I went over to 60 Minutes, again, dedicated to the truth. So looking at the, the truth and then here watching um, Roger Ailes, and I worked with Roger. He did, uh, he did the, Stanley, the Stanley Siegel show at CBS, and I worked with Roger when he did the Stanley Siegel show. But then Roger went on to do the America's Talking, and here, this is a little sidebar, this is kind of fun. Um, uh, when he was starting the America's Talking Network, uh, he put out a contest for uh, saying, anybody out there who wants to become like a, a have a show of their own, submitted a, an audition tape and we'll consider and we're going to award and, and have a contest to let somebody have a, a show of their own. And this is really fun. Our own Bill McCuddy, Bill McCuddy, who's out here in the Hamptons and, and who you can see right here on LTV. I, uh, I had submitted an audition tape, but Bill submitted his and Bill beat me. He, um, Bill got the show that I was hoping I was going to get, but Bill won and for good reason. Uh, he's a better man, smart guy, really talented guy. I was just with Bill over at a fundraiser. Um, Vicki Sniffs from Sniffs Media, they gave out um, awards. Uh, and it was early for the LTV, L, uh, LTVQ, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm thinking LTV, but LBTGQ uh, uh, recipients of these awards, and it was a fundraiser. And Bill was the uh, master of ceremonies, and he also was the auctioneer. And Bill did great as the auctioneer. He auctioned off all these items, and he did it as if he was a professional auctioneer. I have a lot of respect for Bill. I like the guy a lot. He's a very cool guy and uh, very humble, very down to earth. But he has a wonderful show right here on LTV, uh, that, uh, it's, it's, and it's a magazine format as well. So you should uh, you make sure you tune and stay tuned into the content that's coming out of LTV. It's great stuff with great people. Bill is one of them, Bill McCuddy. And we, we like that guy a lot, so, and I was just with him. But anyway, so that regarding the truth, so, so here comes Roger Ailes, and he starts talking about, well, we're going to give you the news, but we're going to give it from a slanted perspective that some people want to be seen, want it seen that way. That was a, a dramatic change from what we expected to get from our news um, distributing organizations. And then, and then Donald Trump. Donald Trump really, he, he took it an even step farther and straight out said, fake news, that's fake news. And we all, especially people who worked in news before, were shocked. It's like, hey, you can't say that. You're assaulting our industry. But you know something? <laughs> you, had to, uh, you had to hand it to Trump, whether you like him or not. You know, he called it. And, and you saw that a lot of news going out there is kind of fake and is slanted. And that's not just because of uh, Roger Ailes, who unfortunately has passed away. But, uh, it's, uh, but news is slanted. And even my old alma mater, CBS, and I trust the CBS network news, and I trust 60 Minutes. Uh, completely. And, uh, and I love that there's still an integrity to their news shows, but there was all kinds of other shows that we know that are, that are, um, they're not telling the truth. They're just telling a story. And so now we don't know how much truth we're getting even from our news organizations. And, um, and in the, in, um, the living novel, the first chapter I have in uh, the living novel, which I'm going to, uh, uh, in our in uh, shows coming up, I'm going to be um, I'm going to be showing you and introducing you and having you logging into. Some people already are are logging into. Uh, pardon me, I'm just going to stretch this out a little bit. And um, so there's um there is this uh, website, and right now it's titled the Bayside Experiment. But in it, there's um there's a uh, a novel, an autobiographical novel, a blog, and and then a part called uh, that went out with the Mayan calendar, and uh, it's it's uh, three different components, but the whole thing is dedicated to presenting the truth. And the first chapter in uh, in binge, uh, I named the, the book binge because I was I came out of Hollywood when I all my years working in Hollywood and running film studios, 
and watching uh, how all the producers would work and realize, you know, Hollywood's like on this binge and it's just, it never purges really. It's just, it's just on this binge. And uh, so a lot of the stories that I write about in my book, uh, Binge, is about Hollywood and and about um, its avarice uh, and, its, and its production methods and how it's kind of on this huge everlasting binge. So I called the book Binge for that reason. And, uh, and then the blog is, uh, is what I am doing on my day to day. It's almost like a diary, but it also, if I go to a, a play or I uh, give a little review of it and just my take on things. And then, uh, that one out with the Mayan calendar part is what I, things that I think that we could do to better our lives and better humanity. So in a way, this is the past, the book about my years at CBS and my, and my experiences in the film industry. The blog, which is the present, me telling you and sharing with you what I'm doing on any kind of day-to-day -day basis, and if I'm going to a musical play or, or any kind of event, if I give a review of it, and then uh, and uh, and then other things that I'll be writing about in a kind of a diary format with the blog, and then that went out with the Mayan calendar. That's about the future and what we can do to make the future better, and it has all kinds of fun. Uh, fun things in it. <laughs> it has um, linguistical, linguistical collectibles where um, just what we use for words and how we can use words to better our environment and, and, be and better our experience. I call it that one out with the Mayan calendar because there are just some things that, okay, we're smart enough now to know, you know, that really doesn't work and you can't keep doing that. I, I've, I, in the past episodes, I just mentioned a real simple thing. You know, some of this is just very, very simple, nothing complicated nothing um, too intense, but I had mentioned uh, the use of the word but. Um, we all just use the word but all the time. If I was to say, I used to think this, but now I'm not so sure. That's a perfect use of the word but. However, if you're in a conversation with somebody and someone is sharing with you their truth and their perspective and they're caring enough to give to you from their heart and from their minds what they know to be something that they think is valuable, to a conversation or or a, a controversy, um, and the first words out of your mouth are "but you got to understand this and you got to understand that." The use of the word "but" in that environment is awful because it immediately sets up an argumentative uh, environment where now someone is uh, you've insulted them. And you've actually said to them, you weren't even listening to them. You were just waiting for your chance to give them your side of the equation. So you weren't even considerate. You weren't even listening to them. Uh, so it has all kinds of negative uh, uh, ramifications. If you start off a sentence in any conversation, but you got to understand this, but you don't get this, but you have to understand this. You have to get, it's a terrible use of the word, but we all do it though. If you just change that and recognize and just, just elevated your consciousness enough to recognize, don't use the word but like that. Give someone uh, a recognition. Show them if someone cares enough to share their opinion with you. Repeat back to them. Let me understand this. This is what you said. I want to make sure I get this right. Uh, and I want to make sure I understand you. And then kind of repeat back to them and acknowledge what they've said. And then assimilate it and then go on to your evaluation. That's wonderful, and that's the way we should be living. However, but, <laughs> but we don't. So, uh, so the use of the word but, that's one of the things that we have in that one out with the Mayan calendar. So what, be should, what should be dismissed and never used again is the word but in its wrong usage because it just screws up the conversation. So little things like that, that you can tweak your environment and your life with, uh, can be very helpful. So. But there's a lot more in this section about that went out with the Mayan calendar. So uh, in, in the, um, the base out experiment and in the living novel, I present the past, present, and future. And in the section of the past, um, it's 13 chapters, and it just talks about my, the experiences, things I witnessed in the television industry and television production. Uh, that talks about living in New York. Uh, talks about some romance and, uh, and my... Uh, the blessed romances I've had in my life, uh, it shares them, and it has, um, and then it talks about my years in Hollywood and then coming back and what I did after that. So it shares my truth. I recognize, as all of us should, that we all see our own truth through our own filters, through our own 
creations, and and sometimes we uh, we we um, represent our and even recognize ourselves in ways that are through a filter, through our ego, through uh, some protections we might have uh, that that might modify an experience enough in a way or a translating experience that might taint it just a little bit. I'm willing to experiment with my own life and say, you know something, I'd rather know myself better than just the way I would know myself through my own filters and, uh, and the limitations of my own perspectives. And I'd rather know myself and everybody around us through a, a broader horizon of understanding. So in uh, Binge, in, in my book, I give an opportunity for anybody who knows me, anybody who knows me and has been a participant in anything that I say, if there's anything that I represent in there that you might see and recognize and remember a little differently, uh, as long as it's contrite, as long as you're sincere, I'm giving you an opportunity to present a different perspective. I'm not going to let any of that get published until I finish and put up all 13 chapters. I'm putting them up kind of live with everybody, even though they're written. I'm going to be kind of presenting them one after the other. And then when I'm finished with, with my presentation of my own truth, I'm going to go back and I'm going to look at everybody who might have been writing something and saying, Greg, you know something? I kind of remember a little differently. And I'm going to examine that. I'm going to embrace it. Uh, and when I, and, um, and as long as I feel that it's not just somebody being a jerk and just wanting to make a fight or stink about something, but really wants to genuinely uh, represent something in a, a, tr a story of mine in a way that um, might be more truthful than even I remember it, I'm going to publish it. I'm going to consider it, publish it, embrace it, and call it my own, and hopefully come out even a better man, a better person with a better understanding of my own life. But it's all about getting to the truth. And the truth, you know, we always hear that expression, there's there's his truth, her truth, or his truth and his truth, and, and, and then there's the real truth. So I just would like to get to the real truth about everything and live in that environment. Because right now, we're living in a world where what can we trust as the truth? The, the fabric of our society uh, of humanity has been based on coming to the truth about things and building from that. So if we're entering into a world where we're recognizing we can't trust the news, we can't trust anything we say, uh, we can't even trust AI for now, uh, this artificial intelligence for what it's going to be telling us that maybe it's not telling us the truth. That's a, do we want to be progressing and evolving into that direction? I don't think so. I think we, um, I think it'd be much better if we consciously choose to say, let's stay, uh, stay, um, stay close and embrace the truth and stick to that, as opposed to continuing going into a world where we can't trust anything anywhere that would just kind of cause chaos and anarchy. I, uh, I think we need to, to keep the weave uh, of our, the fabric of our society based on the strengths on the truth and not let everything get unraveled with everybody else's uh, untruths. So, so I'm kind of a, I'm passionate about that. I'd like to see us all getting back to a place where we're sharing our truths and we can trust each other and that we, uh, we don't start going into this, continuing this direction of, oh, just say anything you want that's going to serve your purposes. And the more uh, demonstrative you are on it and, uh, 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 and um, bombastic and even being a bully, uh, you can bully your way into making your truth a more dominant one to, to go with. I, I don't want to see that. I think that's regressing into a terrible way. So I'm willing to experiment with my own life and say, look, I'll put my truth out there for everyone to see. I don't really have anything to hide. I certainly have things I'm not that proud of. Uh, who wouldn't? Uh, I've made plenty of mistakes. In fact, I've shown a real talent for making making probably every mistake you could make in the world. But uh, in that process of making mistakes, I've learned and I've gained some wisdom from it. Hopefully, God willing, I've uh, become wiser. But so I'm willing to share even the mistakes and, and point out here's some mistakes I've made in the past, some behaviors that weren't as, as um, honorable as I would like them to have been, or I think I would be. Uh, realizing, you know, when you look back at it, you know, maybe that wasn't the greatest choice you ever made. So I'm willing to to um, 
experiment with myself. Kind of like in that movie, remember Pay It Forward? And uh, when Kevin Spacey says, oh, we have a student here who wants to make a contribution to life. And, and he wants to start this kind of movement, pay it forward. I, uh, boy, did I love that movie. And I love that whole concept of taking your life and deciding, let's use it for something that might benefit others. So I'm willing to experiment with my own life uh, and put everything out there for everybody to read. Going to be a lot of people going to want to get there in front of me saying, oh, no, no, I, I want it to be this way before Greg puts it out. So that's why I'm going to tell my truth. Uh, and, uh, and, and tell the stories and, and relay experiences uh, as I've known them, and I'm going to be open and honest about it. And then after I'm finished with that, anybody has anything to say, I'll consider it then. Um, that might be tough. A lot of people think I'm kind of crazy for that. Uh, maybe I am. So, um, well, I've done crazier things, and people have done crazier things. So, so I'm going to do that. So in the Bayside Experiment and the Living Novel, and that's one of the reasons I called it The Living Novel. It's, uh, I'm going to live this novel of my own life right in front of everybody. Take a look if you like. If you don't, fine. But, uh, but at least I feel like there's somebody out there that's willing to tell the truth about his life and let everybody challenge it if they want and come to me with anything you got. And if it's really true, I'll, um, uh, I'll look at it and, and look at my life and probably be very humbled by it. But I'd like to go out of this world and out of this life with having made some kind of contribution and and know my own life even better than uh, the way I can, the way any of us can know it through our own the limitations of our own filters and um, and egos. So so anyway, so the the base that experiment in the upcoming segments, um, some people have have written into me and I've given them the password to get into the living novel and into the base that experiment. Look at these lights. There you go. Ah, there you go. So, uh, so they've gotten passwords. I've given them the credentials to get in, and they've started reading what I've written, and and already started, you know, interacting with it. Uh, it's really, it's really fun. But before I get too overloaded and prepared, uh, I've got a little bit more work to do. The security on it is is wonderfully tight. So, um, well, nothing, anything can be hacked. But we're we're pretty tight with and sophisticated with the security on it. So, so. Uh, the upcoming segments, we're going to be able to look at this together. You'll be able to log in, and uh, and I'll go through some of this with you. There's uh, there's a lot. It's kind of hard to do this backwards, but there's a lot of stuff. There's book the binge and binge the book and the blog and that one out with the mind calendar, and uh, and you know, a lot of other elements to this that uh, I'm happy for people to see and go into and hopefully benefit from. So that's why this is called the living novel. The, um, uh, the again, if you go to, um, if you Google Greg P. Sullivan, uh, and maybe on the post or something we'll be able to write that out. But I spelled my first name Greg with two G's. My middle initial is P for Philip, and then Sullivan S U L L I V A N. I um I don't use the P to be pretentious, but there's a lot of Greg Sullivans out there. So if you Google Greg Sullivan, you're going to find a lot. But if you Google Greg, well, again with the two G's at the end, if you Google Greg P Sullivan, you're going to find an awful lot of stuff from me. You're going to find uh, things that uh, with um, a neighborhood live TV network that I've been developing, uh, contribution that I gave to my hometown of Bayside. Uh, I came back from Hollywood and was taking care of my mom. For a little while and um so in the time that i had i donated a web tv channel to the town and just started doing documentaries about the town um it's similar to what to what i had been doing with ltv a long time ago and what ltv does now stories about local people uh i did things live streaming you'll see the live streaming of uh little league parades and st patrick's day parades but if you went to bayside live tv.com uh, you're going to find a repository, probably about 700 documentaries I've done about the town. Also, uh, the the uh, the dot com site. That's really a uh, like a repository, a library for people to go in and say, I I want to see something from 2012, uh, and 30 years from now, I want to see something from 2024. Uh, so that's really kind of a repository. A real delivery systems. Uh, we when we post something, especially live things, we we do it over Facebook and Instagram. Uh, we started with a little bit of Twitter, um, but uh, but you can uh, if you be followed us on any of these uh, Facebook Bayside Live TV or Facebook Hamptons Live TV or Facebook um, 
Montauk Live TV, Port Washington Live TV. Uh, we're making this donation to different towns, and you can see stories about the local people telling their truths and getting you acquainted with things that are real, that are happening, uh, and that you can trust. I am going to carry on the tradition of, um, of uh, Walter Cronkite and uh, just the facts. So, so on uh, this Neighborhood Live TV, you can go on to that too. Uh, Facebook, Neighborhood Live TV, Instagram, Neighborhood Live TV, or na NeighborhoodLiveTV.com. But we're developing this now, and you can go there and you can find all kinds of wonderfully rich content about the people in those towns, uh, the events of those towns, um, again, parades, um, street fairs, arts and craft shows. So we, we, um, we've made that donation to these towns, and you could go to any of those sites and see a lot of the work that I've been doing over the last couple of years. So, um, and I hope you, I hope you enjoy that. So you could log in and see what they're doing in Bayside anytime you want. So, a, um, so the dedication to the truth. Uh, the first chapter in my book that I mentioned uh, in the, the, the living novel, the first chapter is dedicated to the truth. But since I want to dedicate myself to it and, and making sure we, we uphold the, the fabric of our society, weave together with the truth, um, I did a whole chapter on the truth. Um, thinking I might, uh, in the time that I have, I was going to read a little bit of it for you, but it's, <laughs> it's, it's, um, uh, when you think about what the truth is, let's see if I can pull this up. When you think about what the truth is, it's, um, uh, the truth is very, uh, there's all kinds of truth. There's all kinds of names for the truth. There's the inconvenient truth. There's the truth that can't be told. There's, um, all of a sudden you start, when you looked at the truth, you said, wow, there's a lot of different definitions of what the truth is. Who would have thought that? You would have thought um, there's only one truth. And that, but no, there's a lot of different ways of looking at the truth and the way it's described in different uh, dictionaries and, and, and different uh, things. So, um, so let's see if I can pull up. I'm just going to read you a little excerpt from it. And I'm pulling it up now. Uh, and those and those that are seeing this that that have written in, uh, for me, my my name Greg P Sullivan, uh, at me, simple m e dot com it used to be mac dot com which I liked. Um, Apple changed it from the, the side instead of Greg P Sullivan at mac dot com they changed it to me. When I would say Greg P Sullivan at mac dot com, that's all I ever needed to say. <laughs> when they changed it to me, there's hardly been a time ever. That someone has said, hasn't repeated back to me, 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 I mean, me, and they go, yes, me.com, me. <laughs> so it's Greg P. Sullivan at me, me.com. But um, this, uh, and by the way, this, uh, in this, in this chapter, in this chapter one that, uh, that we have here, it's um, binge, chapter one, the truth. And the very first opening is the truth, uh, the truth will set you free, but first it'll make you miserable. <laughs> And, and uh, I just some of the things that were just funny, but um, uh, speak the truth and the truth will set you free. Or so we have been told. Uh, if this is true, if we speak the truth and the truth will set us free, well then, let's see what happens. Uh, and then I, I'm just going to read a little excerpt of this uh, as I have some time. Um, first, let's cement some understandings and identify some parameters and fundamentals before I start. Uh, let's discuss the truth. Let's talk about the truth as it exists in the world around us, truth as it's taken place in business, truth as we experience it in relationships, in politics, in news reporting, in science, in religion, and within ourselves. There's the truth. Then there's the truth and nothing but the truth. Then there's a truth that can't be told and a truth that's better left unsaid. <laughs> How many of us know about the truth that's better left unsaid? Uh, I'll leave that truth. Don't need to share that. Um, then there's the truth that can't be told. Oh, it's, 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 uh, then there's uh, the truth that de oh, Oscar Wilde, one of the best writers ever. Um, and then there's the truth that dare not speak its name. Then there's the plain truth. Then there's uh, the God awful truth. And the truth, the, the, uh, the Jack Nicholson from, uh, from that movie, he said, you can't handle the truth, truth. So, uh, and then there's the truth that no one knows and the truth that's only going to get you into trouble if you, um, it's only going to get you into trouble if, if you know it, um, if you do know it. And then there, there and then there's, um, 
uh, you know, our, our ex-vice um, president, Al Gore, came up with the expression, then there's the inconvenient truth, as is illustrated by Al Gore. Then it uh, then, uh, seems there's all kinds of truths. And all we know, and, and, all, and what we also know, that under stress, the truth will look different. That's an interesting one. So under stress, we will see the truth differently. There's also a uh, little sidebar that's not written in here. Uh, someone I know uh, was uh, taking a, um, a, um, anti, uh, a, um, a drug for attention deficit disorder. By, and it's called, uh, the drug was called Vibance. And I, I read the, um, you know, I read about this thing. So what are they taking, this Vibance stuff? <laughs> and, and in the, um, uh, you, just, you can't believe this, but in the um, side effects, the potential side effects, it says very clearly, this is crazy, this is crazy. This is the reality that you're living in. There are people out there taking attention deficit disorder drugs that it actually says, in the side effects, that prolonged use of this will make you suspicious. Is, is this a verbatim? Well, as close as verbatim as I can make it. That will make you suspicious and see things that are not there and hear things that are not true. We actually allow a drug <laughs> to go out into our society that will make our society suspicious and see things that are not there and believe things that are not true. I'm not making this up. Look up Vyvanse, V-Y-V-A-N-C-E. Look up Vyvanse. Uh, and uh, when I read this, I was like, I was like oh, what kind of world are we creating here? This is nuts. So again, all about conscious evolution. What do we want to do with the direction of our society? And what do we think might not be that good? I just don't think it's that good to be feeding, pumping drugs into our society that will that tell you they will make you suspicious and see things that are not there and hear things or believe things that are not true, that will believe things that are not true. And we allow a drug to go out <laughs> to go out to the society with that? That's, it, that's insanity. But okay, so we're living in an insane world, the conscious evolution, let's see if we can bring some sanity back to it. But first, let's start off with the truth. But, uh, okay, so it seems there's all kinds of truth. And, uh, and then there's the truth that under stress we know will look different. And the truth keeps changing. That's another thing. Uh, history keeps changing. What we thought was true about yesterday and what was true uh, and, and what was true today is not necessarily going to be what's true tomorrow. You know, the, the truth was the world was flat. The world was flat. Get it? And that was the truth until we came up with a different truth and realized it wasn't. There's so much history that is changing. So what was true yesterday <clears throat> and even what was true today may not be true tomorrow. So look at that question about the truth, right? And then truth, the whole truth, our truth, their truth, your truth, truth and nothing but the truth, the truth and nothing but the truth. So help me God. So now you're putting God into this thing. God, I'm going to tell the truth no matter what. But as we're learning, even when we're trying to say, so help me God, but even God might be looking down and saying, for those who believe in God, as I do, I believe in a higher power, you know, a divine imagination that uh, is all seeing. And it's not just, it's not an AI. But, uh, but so God might be looking up and say, oh, look at these humans. Uh, they're cute, these little humans. They, they think that their truth is the truth. And they're saying, so help me God. Well, I, I you know, Okay, so God may be helping us with the truth. Anyway, uh, the truth, so help me God. And, and, and oh my Lord, what is that? Is that, uh, is that the kind of truth we're crying out about, hoping to gain recognition and stature for when we uh, have conflicting and doubtful truths? Doubtful truths. There, now there's another. It's like an oxymoron. Doubtful truth. Is it doubtful or is it the truth? So I love oxymorons too. And by the way, in, the, uh, in that one out with the Mayan calendar, there's a whole section about uh, linguistics and words and, and a list of oxymorons that because uh, we do love words and how we can use them to express ourselves. So there's a whole section there about words and with oxymorons in them. So an oxymoron like doubtful truths. There's there's uh, doubt. Uh, there's pretty ugly. Uh, Betty Davis was a. a <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't make this one up. But Betty Davis was a great actress, but she was pretty ugly. Was she pretty? Was she ugly? There's there's all kinds of uh, oxymorons that are kind of fun. There's one oxymoron. There's one oxymoron. It, uh, it, it's a one word 
oxymoron. In the Chinese uh, vocabulary, one word oxymoron that means opportunity and danger at the same time. Anyway, just a little digression. So, uh, so uh, doubtful, truth. doubtful truths notwithstanding. Looks like we've got all kinds of truths when you think about it. Actually, the more you think about it, the more truths we seem to be able to find. Uh, that could be scary. Um, uh, and what of the truth of the visionary? Uh, the truth that nobody else sees yet. Um, the truth of the visionary. Someone recognizes something and says, "This is going to be this is going to be our uh, a truth that you're all going to accept at some point." Uh, let's go back to the you know the visionary said, "No, the world isn't flat." Well, that visionary, everyone thought he was lying, but now you're looking and saying, "No, that uh, it is true what the visionary is saying." So there's the truth of the visionary. There's um, the truth that nobody sees yet. Uh, uh, and but it seems that it, but it it does uh, it but it is seen with such clarity in the minds, hearts, and soul of uh, the prescient, uh, clairvoyant, um, or the the truth sense through women's intuition. Women's intuition. Uh, uh, God bless them. Women do have an intuition. We we don't have that phrase for nothing. Women have an intuition about things, and we uh, say it's just intuition, but it winds up. Probably true. So, so truth can come from just intuition when nobody else can see the facts about it. Um, uh, what of that truth seen and recognized by those who look ahead? How am I? Oh my God! So, uh, and what of the truth seen and recognized by those who look ahead to things we do not and did not see before, but that have been revealed and, and have revealed themselves uh, to us through the simplest and most desirable of gateways: the open mind. And uh, or even prayer or meditation, the truths that to us that can come through there. So uh, Schopenhauer said, and I love this. I'll just go. To, this has worked with my life a lot. Schopenhauer said that all great truths, all great truths, go through three processes. First, they're ridiculed. If someone didn't see it, don't someone didn't think the world was round and thought it was flat, and you tell them the truth, first you're going to get ridiculed. And then uh, the second is that they are violently and passionately opposed. If you keep pushing a truth like the world is round and someone who's only known it as flat, and you keep pushing on it, you're going to get violently opposed. So first you're ridiculed, then you're violently opposed. And then here's uh, my favorite. And the third is all of a sudden they get it and they take it as self-evident. <laughs> so, uh, so first it's ridiculed, then it's violently opposed, then it's taken as self-evident. The three processes of the, of the truth. And... Um, and what of these uh, caliber truths? Um, the, um, the the thing about taking it self evident. Something that I've experienced uh, is that is that I've um, you know I've, I've seen things and said you know something. Uh, here's a truth that's coming our way. Even when I talked about uh, what I, I worked at the I was at the University of Southern California working in a secret lab on developing internet technologies for film industry application. And I started telling people about the internet. And they were like, oh, they, you know, they didn't believe it. And I said, look, I'm telling you, this is going to change your business, change everything else. No one wanted to believe me. But, um, but then all of a sudden, once they did, this was the fun part, uh, once they did understand it and get it, then they thought that they thought it up. You can tell something someone that they'll ridicule, that they'll violently oppose, and all of a sudden, once they understand it, they think they're smart because they just got it. Even though you were like, you've been, it's like that's what I've been telling you for the last eight months. And all of a sudden, once they get it, they think that they got it, and it's their idea. That's a little irritating. But um, so is society <laughs> on many different levels. So most of uh, most of the time these days, I think the whole world is built around lies. I mean, it really just, it's crazy out there. So most of the time these days, I think the whole world is built around lies and all fall into one of two categories, the lies people tell one another and the lies we tell to ourselves. Uh, and I don't want to be a party to either of those. I want to be a party to um, going and finding the truth, sharing the truth, and building a relationship and building a future based on the truths and not in some sort of chaotic uh, unraveling of our, the, the society, of uh, the fabric of our society by uh, dismissing and moving away from the truth. So I'm going to, I'm going to finish uh, with just that. And that's only, that's only um, one couple of paragraphs of a couple of pages that I write about the truth. And, and, um, and when you read it, you realize, wow, the truth is, complicated and and very uh, dynamic in so many different ways so uh, 
So I start off my the book section of this, um, which again, uh, the, the living novel, as I'm presenting it, uh, for me, has three parts, past, present, and future. And, uh, and then the, in the, in the uh, past part called Binge, where I talk about uh, my past and uh, share my experiences in television and, and, uh, and film and theater, uh, I share those truths, but I start off with, a, with a, an essay on the truth itself. So I hope you'll read it. And, and, and like it, and hopefully I'll make some sense to you, and, uh, and see if then we can't do something to help make the world a better place. So um, keep going and taking a look at thebaysideexperiment.com. And if you want the credentials for it, uh, you, can, you can email me at gregpsullivan at me, M -E .com, and I will respond and I'll, uh, I'll talk with you and give you credentials and you can come in and see it. Pretty soon, it'll, uh, I'm going to take the front page off and everybody can see everything that's in it and then you can join and you can make all the contributions you want and hopefully benefit from, uh, from my experiences that I'm happy to share with everybody and my experimenting with my own life and saying, yeah, I'll put it out there. And anybody who knows me, uh, you're welcome to weigh in and tell me, Greg, I don't know, I think you're cracked. But it doesn't, that's not the way I remember it. And I'll listen to you. And again, I'll uh, broaden the horizon of my understanding and absorb it and uh, kind of rethink things out. So it's even an experiment for myself. So the base out experiment, the living novel. I'm Greg Sullivan. I'm out here on the, uh, the end of Long Island and, um, and writing this for you. It's, uh, I'm coming to you from LTV, a place that uh, is really gorgeous and their contributions they make to the community are really worthwhile. You should donate to LTV, but no matter what, you should watch the content. Watch the stuff that they're producing out of here, out of LTV. It's really wonderful with wonderful people doing wonderful shows that you all can benefit from and it's your neighbors. It's uh, the people of the town uh, making their contributions and sharing what they can with everybody else. So I want to thank everyone here at LTV again and uh, Ellen Watson, who's been great. Ellen uh, deals with me with uh, my scheduling and calling her up on the Long Island Expressway. Ellen, I'm on my way. I'm coming. I'm coming. Uh, and Josh and Zach uh, for setting up the cameras and working inside uh, and also for introducing me to some great technology with these microphones that are hidden up in the ceiling. So, uh, so that's kind of fun. So um, thank you for joining me. Please log in. Uh, start considering the living novel as something we are a new genre of literature that you can uh, you can participate in. You can be writing in the same style. I'm going to go into a little bit more about what the living novel is and how it connects people together and it brings its community enhancing. It's community enhancing and it is um, uh, something that I believe is going to hopefully catch on to have people sharing and telling their truths and keeping everybody honest uh, and on point and, um, and benefit society that way. So thank you very much for joining me. Again, I'm Greg Sullivan uh, coming to you from LTV Studios out here in Wainscott, Long Island, and, uh, and appreciating this opportunity that LTV has given me to, to record these podcasts and talk to you. Thanks very much.